In this lecture, we're going to introduce how to do several different types of loops in PIC assembly. So up until this point, we've learned how to do if statements. We've learned how to check on certain bits. Now we want to know how to run code multiple times. So generally, there's several types of loops. And if you've learned any programming language, MATLAB or C or anything else, you know that we can run several different types of loops. You can run an infinite loop. That will be code that runs forever. You can have a while loop, which is going to run generally an indeterminate number of times, but until a certain condition is met or um, while a certain condition is still met. And you can have for loops, which are generally designed to run a set number of times. And so let's look at how each of those might be utilized in a microcontroller. First of all, infinite loops. A lot of times you don't want an infinite loop in your code. In uh, most programming languages, that can lead to uh, hogging of memory resources and just getting stuck uh, in a program. But in microcontroller programming, it really is pretty typical to have an infinite loop. So you might think about certain things that just run continuously. So for example, your digital alarm clock is just continuously keeping track of the time. It's incrementing time and it's running all of the time in the background. You might think about certain functions on your cell phone which are continually running, checking to see if you have a text message or an incoming call, if you have proper connectivity to the network of your choice. All those different things just run in the background and they update on a regular basis and they keep running until you turn off that particular appliance. And so a lot of microcontroller driven circuits are designed to just run things in succession. And so infinite loops are very useful for that. Let's look at how that might be built. Generally that's built with a label. In this case I've just put the label loop out here. And then you can put whatever code you want to run in that loop. That could be just one line of code. Could be multiple lines of code. In this case, I've got my code running here. Even more code running there. Could be whatever lines of assembly you want. And then at the end, you just have a go-to loop. So you're going to execute this. You're going to get to this go-to. And you're going to start it all over again. So in the case of, say, a digital clock, you're going to go through, you're going to increment your time that's in memory by one second. You're going to update all of your displays. And then you're going to go through the process again. Increment the time by one second, delay for one second, and update all of the displays. So that's what happens inside of an infinite loop for a digital clock. You might think about similar approaches for a variety of other applications. While loops, also very important. As we mentioned, that allows us to keep running code either until something is true or while something still is true. And so that's very similar to the infinite loop. The infinite loop is going to run an indeterminate number of times. Could run just about forever. Um, but a while loop is going to run until we meet a specific condition. So we don't know how many times we're going to be ending up going on through that loop. But the while loop is different from the infinite loop in that it does have some kind of an escape sequence. So there is something that could happen, whether it be an external event or a uh, a counter reaching a certain value or things like that that allow you to get out of that particular loop. So here's how that might work. Generally what we do is utilize a bit test that's going to skip over that go to statement when a particular condition is met. So in this case you'll see the loop structure looks very similar to the infinite loop that we already talked about. You've got a label, you've got a go to loop, but down here, right before that go to, we've got some kind of a sequence that we're checking for, some kind of a condition we're checking for to see if we can escape out of that loop. And so if that happens, we're going to go down to this line uh, labeled escape. Escape and loop here are not special uh, names at all. Those are just labels that I have happened to use in this particular coding example. So in this case, what we're doing is we're running code until a 1 is detected on port B bit 0. So right here we have a bit test on port B bit 0. If it is set, that is if that bit is a 1, we're going to skip over and get on to the escape. If it is anything other than a 1, if it is a 0, we're going to just fall right through to the next line of code and go back to the loop. So, so long as port B bit 0 is not a 1, we're going to keep running whatever code happens to be in here. Once it does get to be a 1, 
then we're going to skip out. So that could be designed for waiting for a button to be pressed. So maybe you've got some kind of an alarm going off and it's going to keep going off until you hit uh, a particular button to silence it. So you might think about a kitchen timer where it's going to go off until you press a button to silence it or a smoke detector or something like that um, where you're waiting on a particular push button and otherwise you just keep running through the loop. For loops allow us to execute code typically a set number of times. So you might want to run something ten times, you might want to run it three times or whatever it happens to be. And typically the way that's structured in other programming languages is you have a counter variable and it's going to be initialized to a certain condition. You might start it at zero or one and you're going to keep incrementing it until you get to a certain threshold. Or you might start it at an initial value and keep decrementing it until you get all the way down to one or down to zero and then you're going to escape from that. And so we can create a counter variable and then what we can do is inside of that variable we can preset it with a particular value and then we can decrement it or we can increment it every time we pass through the loop and keep checking to see if it's reached zero or some other predefined limitation. So this is a very important thing to learn. This part up here at the top is how you declare a variable. So a variable declaration has three parts. It has the name of the variable as a label over here. It has an EQU statement, which just means equate. And then it has a memory location. And that memory location will be where that variable will reside in the memory available on board your microcontroller. It's very important that a few things happen when you declare a variable. Number one, you don't want to declare a variable in the same memory location as any other variable that you've declared and you also don't want to declare a variable in any memory location that's taken up by other special function registers. If you look in the PIC data sheet, what you will see is in each of the banks there happen to be um, memory locations for special function registers and then some banks give you the availability of some general purpose registers and this is where you can store your variables so in this case I am in bank 0 and my count variable is going to be in memory location 20 which is just outside of where all the special function registers are in bank 0 and so what am I doing with my count variable down here before I get into the loop so these variable declarations tend to be up at the top of code. Um, we'll talk about how to structure the file format for your coding a little bit later, but these will generally be towards the top. And so what you're going to do is you're going to have this variable and we're going to initialize it. In this case, we're initializing it to decimal 15. So we're moving a literal into W, decimal 15. We're moving that value in W over to count. So count should now be equal to 15. And so what we want to do is get into the loop. The loop starts right here with my label loop. And it's whatever you're going to do inside the loop. But we want to run that uh, 15 times. So what we're going to do is we're going to decrement our count. And we're going to put the decremented value of count, that is one less than count, back into count itself. That's what this comma 1 means. And then what we're going to do is if that is 0, we're going to skip over. Otherwise, we're going to go back through the loop. So if we trace this through, count's going to start out at 15. You're going to do whatever you're doing in the loop. You're going to decrement count. Now it's 14. 14 is not 0, so we don't skip. We go to the loop. We go back. We do whatever happens in the loop. We decrement it again. Now it's 13, and 13 is still not 0, so we go back through the loop. You're going to keep doing this until you get down to 1, and then you decrement 1. That does give you 0. When that decrementing gets you to zero, you don't run again, you skip over the go to, and you run down here to this next line, which I've labeled escape. And so again, loop and escape are not special built-in names. You could use whatever you want. I happen to be using count here, loop, and escape. Those are just variable names that I happen to have picked. Checking for equality is also an important thing to be able to use in a loop, particularly in loops where you may want to be counting upward to a particular threshold. So you may be wanting to uh, count how many people come into a room and you know what the capacity is, so you want to check to see if you've equaled your capacity. Um, so in that particular example, what you might do 
is instead of decrementing inside the for loop like you did, you might increment and then you might check to see after you've incremented the value if you have equaled the particular value of interest. There's not a direct way to do a comparison of one value to another, but what we can do is use the exclusive or operation to check for equality. And let me demonstrate how you might do that. First of all, you need to think about what happens when you take two binary values and you run the exclusive or operation on them. So if we run exclusive or bitwise, that is comparing one bit to the corresponding bit in the same location in memory in another uh, binary value, what you know is with an exclusive or, you have to have a one and a zero in a pair. If you have the same values, if they're both ones or they're both zeros, the exclusive or outputs a zero. And we can use that to check for equality. So for example, if you have two binary values and every one of their bits is exactly the same, um, such that everywhere you have a zero in one value, you have a zero in the other, everywhere you have a one in one value, you have a one in the other, then when you run the exclusive or on them, what you're going to do is the entire result is going to go to zero. And so if that happens, then you know every single bit is aligned and every single bit is the same as the other value. So here's a way we can use that to check for equality. If we wanted to see if the value on port B was equal to five, we would go ahead and we could move a little five in a W and we could exclusive or the contents of W with our port B and we're going to put the result of that exclusive oring back into W. Now we don't want to change port B, we want to leave port B whatever it is, um, but we want to compare uh, the five to the value in port B to see if port B is in fact equal to five. And to do that we're going to put the results into the W register and then what we're going to do is check to see if after we do that exclusive oring if the result was a zero. So if the result is zero then the Z bit in the status register will go to one and we know that port B was in fact equal to five. So if the result was anything other than zero then we know that the value in port B was not equal to five. So if we do this bit test then we can add in these two go to statements. If we do a bit test and z was equal to 1, we're going to skip. That means that b is 5 because the result was 0, so now z is a 1. So that means b is equal to 5. Otherwise, we're going to fall down to the next line of code, and that means b is not 5. And you can go to whatever you want to do if b is 5 or b is not 5, if you think about this like an if statement. So here's how you can use equality inside a loop. If we've declared a counter as a variable, just like we did before, let's go ahead and clear it on out. Then inside of your loop, you can do whatever it is you want to be doing in the loop. You could be playing a song. You could be putting out a message on an LCD panel. You could do whatever it is you're going to do in that loop. And then we're going to go ahead and increment the counter. So we're going to put that result back into the counter itself. So that's basically counter is equal to the counter plus one. And we want to know if we have gone through this loop 10 times. So we're going to move a literal into W. That's going to equal hexadecimal A, which we know is 10. And we're going to exclusive or our counter variable with what we put into W, which is that 10. And we're going to put the result of that exclusive or back into W. And then we're going to check the status register, just like we did before. And so if we are not equal to 10, then that means that the Z bit is not going to be set and we're going to fall through down to this loop and it's going to go back up to here. If we are equal to 10, then the Z bit is going to get set after this exclusive or and we're going to skip over and get down to this line that we've labeled escape. And then it can go ahead and do whatever it was. That means we've gone through the loop 10 times. So hopefully you have learned a good bit about how to make loops, and we will practice that this week in your in-class assignments.